In the next part of this lecture, we're going to look at the biological and evolutionary influences on psychology. And sticking mostly with the 18th, uh, so 19th century, again, the 1800s. So in evolution, the theory of natural selection and the scientific evidence for evolution became very well accepted after Charles Darwin's book in 1859. But this acceptance wasn't just a single event, but it took time and was controversial. And we're going to look at which aspects of evolutionary theory have most entered into psychological theory, psychological relevance. So in his book, Darwin didn't mention much about human psychology in The Origin of Species. But in later works, he wrote several more books, in particular The Descent of Man and The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. He did. And talked about sexual selection, developmental psychology, um, some of the psychological functions in uh, orangutans and other animals. He did a biographical psychological sketch of his son and even did a bit of dream analysis before Freud got there. So in The Descent of Man, Darwin talked mostly about language and sex differences as it relates to psychology. And a sentence which sort of sums up his thoughts about how humans might be related to the theory of evolution is that man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. And that's a famous quote which comes, I think, from The Descent of Man. And in the expression of the emotions, Darwin produced a clearly psychological book on the emotions and facial expressions in humans across culture, across different parts of the world. And his theory was that the expression of the emotions is really an evolutionary adapted trait in humans. So if we take a look at this a cross section through a human woman and a chimpanzee, and they obviously have a lot in common in terms of the structure of their head and neck. So Darwin was looking at the, the similar physical structure of apes and humans and was asking, is language just, um, is it a specific adaptation, a set of adaptations in the, the face and the neck and the, the muscles? Or is it sort of a byproduct of other things? Is it a byproduct, for example, of having a large brain? And when you look at the anatomy specifically, you'll see that there are large differences in, in the larynx, in the vocal cords, the mouth and the lips between humans and, say, chimpanzees. And a lot of these differences seem to be highly adapted for language. And so Darwin would argue that language has been selected for throughout evolution in humans. And this idea is still around in, in psychology of language and linguistics. And you may have heard of um, Noam Avram Chomsky, who argues this view that while languages might evolve culturally, say the specific words and the specific accents or dialects might survive and some might die out. So languages will evolve for, over time. But something about language has got to be innate. So, for example, the ability to acquire language seems to be innate. And this is a nativist view, as proposed by, for example, Chomsky. But Darwin mentioned this as well. So while the ability to acquire languages are innate, specific languages aren't. And most modern languages and most languages throughout time are not deliberately designed as such. They sort of evolved and are selected in a sort of more of a cultural evolution kind of way. And so Darwin sort of applied the principle of natural selection to the more cultural evolution and development of distinct and distinctions between human languages. Now while Darwin's most famous principle of evolution was of natural selection, in which is random changes being adapted in individuals and populations to changing environments. He also wrote about sexual selection, and that's, for example, how a female, like a, a pea hen, might prefer certain characters in the male, in the peacock. So here's an image at the top of a, a pea hen looking at a male's, the male peacock's feathers and saying they look rather nice. You look a bit all right. Um, and this, this preference in the female is exerting a selection pressure over over the male, whether whether that male gets to survive and re reproduce or not, is partly dependent on whether females will find him attractive. And so various biological differences, such as libido or colour or aggression or longevity, they may all make particular animals in a species more likely to, to reproduce successfully. So when viewed along with natural selection, this set of pressures are additional selective pressures that influence reproductive success. So it's the sexual selection of females of males or, or males of females. And Darwin talked about two kinds of sexual selection. One is inter and one is intra sexual selection. So intersexual selection is when one sex, for example, females, prefers members of the other sex. So 
a female will have a particular preference for a certain kind of male's tail. That's a, a preference operating between the sexes. And the peacock and the peahen is the example of that. The second example is intrasexual selection, and that's when competition within a sex, and it's usually male, occurs, and, and that allows them to have access to the other sex, the females, or to resources. And a good example of this is the deer's antlers. You know, male deer tend to have large, pointy, quite sharp antlers, and they're used as a symbol of power and dominance, and they're used in fighting for access to the females or access to resources. And the proboscis monkey, the males have a very large nose, and I believe that's something to do with aggression or um, other male characteristics. So in a much more mainstream psychological topic, Darwin talked a lot about facial expressions. This is in his book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And he argued that facial expressions are innate and that their meaning is universally understood understood across cultures. So you could take a face from someone in the Philippines and show it to someone in Africa, and they should be able to understand the emotion being expressed. An alternative viewpoint to this is an anthropologist viewpoint, particularly from Margaret Mead, who said that in fact, these emotions are culturally conditioned so that the emotional expressions of someone in the, in the Ameri- in United States will be different from those in, say, Russia. And this argument was kind of settled when Paul Ekman, a psychologist from the United States, went to different countries and looked at different isolated populations to ask which of these things was true. Is it that the same emotions are seen in the same ways in different countries? Or is it more an anthropologist, sort of socially constructed or culturally conditioned view that emotional facial expressions are different? And in this case, Ekman and Darwin tended to be right on this one. So Ekman found a lot of evidence across many different cultures that there are basically six emotional expressions in the face. And here's a chap at the top showing four of them from left to right. Happiness, sadness, disgust and anger, I think. So the full list is happiness, surprise, sadness, fear, disgust and anger. And later on, a seventh one was added just for good measure, which is contempt, which probably came from a form of disgust. So Ekman then found evidence that supported Darwin's view that emotional expressions were sort of universal across human cultures. And further evidence for this view comes from examples of, for example, children who are born blind and deaf at birth. Now, they have no way of copying their parents or other other humans' uh, facial expressions with emotions, but, but these children also display the same sorts of facial expressions when they experience these emotions. So it can't be learnt, that's the idea there. Another source of evidence is that uh, cute baby chimps seem to like playing with cute baby white tigers. So we've dealt with a lot of Darwin's work directly, but what about all the people who were influenced pretty much directly by Darwin? And one of the first to really take up the Darwinian movement was um, Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. He was a polymath, so he, he was a scientist. He had independent funding, so he could sort of lounge around at home all day doing his experiments and thinking. Um, and he did an awful lot of these, um, these experiments and these thoughts. So he's contributed to many fields, and four of them which we're not going to look at are meteorology. For example, he was the first person to put weather maps in newspapers. Um, in forensics, he invented fingerprinting methods. In statistics, he came up with scatter plots, correlation and regression. And in photography, he came up with a method called composite photographs, where multiple photographs are exposed into the same photograph. But Galton's also one of the first and most prolific psychologists. And his contributions in psychology were largely sort of statistical and looking at individual differences and intelligence testing. And the things, the topics he looked at included how genius is inherited or how sort of eminent men in Victorian life were. He looked at their breeding, essentially, looked at what their parents were like and what their families were like. Galton coined the phrase nature versus nurture, which I'm sure you've heard of. And he did this in the context of his twin studies, which we still use today. And that's the idea that you take two sets of twins, one are identical, one are non-identical, or you take two sets of twins, one who are reared up in the same household and one pair who are reared apart. And you look at how they develop differently. And because he was a very busy chap, he also 
uh, did lots of work on synesthesia, mental imagery, mental number lines, and more besides. At this point, it's worth also pointing out that he, uh, Galton, was known, uh, is known as being sort of the father of the eugenics movement, and we'll deal with that in the next part of this lecture. Uh, it's a very tricky subject, but um, it really is important to the history of psychology to look at how Galton was involved in eugenics. Another psychologist to be influenced quite directly by Darwin was William James in the United States, and he focused on the function of consciousness rather than its contents. So in the last lecture, we looked at um, some of the introspective psychologists, Wundt and Titchener, and they had the view of structuralism that we, we need to look into the mind's structure and see how it's structured, and then also we need to look at all the atoms of thought, see what, see what all the bits and pieces are. But James's approach was more functionalism, so it's not so important what the mind's made of, it's more important what it does and what it's for. So James was not too bothered about introspection. Instead, he had sort of grander thoughts, and he had other thoughts on free will, and whether mind and body are the same thing. And one of his ideas was dual aspect, mind and body are two physical, two aspects of the same thing. But we'll come back to James's views on these topics later in the lecture series. More important here then is William James's functionalism, and you can also call it a holistic view in that we should look at the whole stream of consciousness, not its elements or atoms. So he, he didn't like Titchener's atomic or elemental psychology. William James is also a pragmatist. He thought that beliefs and ideas should be judged on whether they're useful or not. And echoing Darwin, he talked about the adaptive function of consciousness. So what is consciousness for? What purpose does it solve in a sort of evolutionary framework? He also talked about instinct and choice, that's free will. So humans have many instincts, maybe even more than animals, but one thing we're able to do is override them by choice. And these instincts are very much the topic of um, ethology that we were talking about in the last session, last part, and also um, the biological determinants of behaviour. And one major contribution that James made to so biological psychology at the turn of the century was the idea that emotions are the mind making sense of physiological changes in the body. And his idea was that emotion actually comes after the changes in the body. And the typical example is that we see a tiger, we start running, and then only later do we feel the, the fear and the shock and the horror of that tiger. Um, and I've been reliably informed by many nature programs that you should not run away from a tiger. Um, he can run, <laughs> tigers can run much faster than you, and they can climb trees, so don't run away. So the James theory of emotion then is that emotions come after the bodily changes. And another scientist called Lang also had this same idea, and it's often called the James-Lang theory of emotion. And the alternative view is that actually emotion is the first thing and the body reacts later. That's the Cannon-Bard theory. So in this short summary of how evolutionary theory has influenced the early psychologists, we saw that Darwin himself wandered into psychological thought by trying to extend natural selection to some aspects of human psychology, particularly language, emotions, sex differences and sexual selection. But most importantly, he has inspired others to use evolutionary ideas in their own work. Most specifically, Galton was directly inspired by his cousin Darwin, and Galton worked on statistics and the inheritance of intelligence, and later on eugenics, which we'll talk about in the next bit. William James was very much influenced by instinct and the physiology of the emotions, and Paul Ekman and Margaret Mead were influenced uh, by Darwin into looking at the facial expression of emotions. So I should thank all the people that contributed this work, and make sure you write down some questions, and we'll talk about them next week. <laughs>